Hello, and welcome to Software Architecture Monday. My name is Mark Richards. I'm a hands-on software architect and also the founder of developer2architect.com, a free website to help you in your journey from developer to architect. In today's lesson, number 83, we'll continue to look at these various architecture characteristics and define performance and responsiveness and kind of see the difference between those. When we talk about the definitions of each of these, performance is really defined as the amount of time it takes for a request or a particular event to be processed, whereas responsiveness is defined as the amount of time a client receives information or feedback from posting an event or request that's being processed. Uh, these two may seem similar, but they're handled architecturally in two different ways. Let me show you an example. What I'd like to do is post a comment on our website. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to type in a comment right here and hit post. Now let's make a RESTful call over to our comment service, which is going to be synchronous. And that comment service on the right-hand side is going to take three seconds to post that comment. As a matter of fact, let me do that right now and I'll illustrate what's happening. So I'm going to type in the comment and hit post. Ready, set, go. Thank you for your comment. That was a lot of downtime. And here's what's happening, everyone. So it's taking some latency, 50 milliseconds of latency, uh, network latency, to get that request over to that service. And then that service is now taking 3,000 milliseconds to post that comment. Now, it has to do a lot of checking. For example, bag word checking. It has to do certain things like context checking to make sure that the comment that you're actually posting is not just some sort of political rant and also uh, grammar parsing and stuff. And then it does all that and then sends that request back to you saying thank you basically and that's 50 milliseconds to give you that thank you for your comment to tell you what was posted which took 3100 milliseconds. Now let's use asynchronous communication to be able to do this. So we're going to use either async rest or in the example I'm giving here, just simple queuing. And so what I'm going to do is I'm going to type in that comment I am posting to the website and I'm going to press the post button. When I do that, it takes 25 milliseconds to actually get that to a particular queue. But at that point, the control comes back over to the client. So the response time now is 25 milliseconds from the client's point of view. Of course, because this is async, it's taking 25 milliseconds to get to that service and 3,000 milliseconds to now post it. The question is this, which would you rather give your customers? A response time of 3,100 milliseconds or 25? And clearly the bottom root of 25 milliseconds. However, isn't it interesting that I have not addressed performance in this system at all. You see, the comment service in either the top synchronous or the bottom asynchronous is still taking 3,000 milliseconds. I've done nothing to address the overall performance of this system. I could do that by leveraging caching and some threading to run the various checking engines in parallel and stuff to maybe bring that down to 800 milliseconds, which would be addressing the performance in the system. However, what I've done is I've changed the communication protocol from synchronous to asynchronous, therefore not impacting performance, but the overall responsiveness of the system. And that really kind of illustrates the difference between responsiveness and actual performance. Now, when we take a look architecturally at the two of these, the type or style of architecture that we do use does in fact influence both the performance and responsiveness. And that curve looks similar to this. When we start out with our monolithic layered architectures right here, we have fairly low levels of performance and responsiveness due to the lack of threading, of parallelism, and also asynchronous behavior. Certainly we can add that to our layered architectures, but that really is mixing up 
uh, architectures in terms of creating a hybrid of an event-driven layered architecture. If we do move over to that event-driven architecture, we see a significant rise in both performance and also responsiveness. Now, the responsiveness comes in, just as I identified earlier in the prior slide, with regards to the asynchronous behavior that event-driven does support. However, the performance comes in through being able to do things at the same time in parallel. But we can still increase performance and responsiveness even higher by moving to something called space-based architecture. Now, space-based architecture, and basically space-based gets its name from a computer science term called tuple space, which is uh, defined as multiple parallel processors with shared memory. So we have high levels of elasticity with load balanced processing units that have data in memory. And so this isn't going back and forth to a database. And that's where we get that high level of both performance and responsiveness now because now all data access is in memory talking more about nanoseconds of data retrieval as opposed to seconds of data retrieval. Now, when we go to measure performance and responsiveness, measuring these are essentially the same technique. And one of the easiest things to actually measure, because essentially all we're really capturing is an API request and the overall duration of that request. And then we can aggregate these API requests into further domains and application contexts. And once we've gathered the start time, start time, start time, stop time, and then subtract those two, we can now measure both the maximum response times per any given context, whether that be a single request or a group of requests in a particular domain, let's say all of our customer or all of our payment processing, um, per any sort of time unit. I can also look at the average cumulative response times as well. Let's take a look at the average, for example. Now, the average and max can be done in the same manner, but whether I'm tracking a particular request, a domain such as customer, or an overall application such as, such as our order entry, uh, what I can start to track upon any given time unit, let's say per day, and this is a daily average, are all the points at which during the day that request what is the average response time for that particular day? And notice now, by tracking the average, it tends to get rid of a lot of those outliers, both small and large ones, um, but also starts showing us an overall trend based on that average. And do you notice, this trend over time means that our systems are starting to degrade in performance. As a matter of fact, I can run or write fitness functions to be able to run continuous fitness functions in a production environment, both threshold and trend-based. So a threshold fitness function might look like this. Continue to monitor a particular request or a particular context, but send me an alert when the average response time within any given context exceeds a certain amount, let's say 1400 milliseconds. I can fail deployments as a triggered fitness function when I'm going through deployment or as a continuous fitness function in production. Now, I usually don't care for the threshold fitness functions on these because of some outliers. If we have a, a server failures or a particular time period of, of a market correction or something that that's not normal um, will start to give me false positives. And for that reason, I really like a trend fitness function. This is better at getting rid of those outliers, everyone. And so what the trend fitness function, what I'm going to do is continually monitor. Um, but here, I'm gonna send an alert when the average response time continues to increase over X period of time. In other words, if I start to see an increase don't panic because it may be some outliers, um, but over a period of time, let's say weeks or months, if that continues to increase, that's when I get that alert because this now means systems are starting to degrade in performance. So for more information, um, you can go to our new book uh, that Neil Ford and I wrote, The Fundamentals of Software Architecture, where we do talk a lot about these kind of characteristics um, in much more detail. As a matter of fact, almost the first third of the book is devoted to uh, a lot of the architectural characteristics 
uh, associated with um, performance and scalability and all these others. Um, and so I've provided the links there. Um, also, uh, you can certainly go to Software Architecture Monday where all these lessons are housed and there's 82 previous ones out there. Um, also, I do private and public training as well, both in microservices and also software architecture. Um, you can see my private training classes by going to the second link there and also um, where I'm doing public events. And this is both live in person as well as live online events by going to my upcoming events page. And so this has been Lesson 83, Defining Performance and Responsiveness. Again, my name is Mark Richards, and stay tuned in two more Mondays um, for another lesson in software architecture. Thank you so much for listening.